so carnitine is found where in nutrition in the diet? Red meat? Yep. Red meat. Specifically red meat. Oh, I thought that was bad for longevity. So confusing. Um, and then what are the dosing? What is the dose of uh, carnitine? In carnitine, I don't know what an effective dose would be. You know, like I'd say, like, I think it varies from person to person depending on how depleted you are. So, you know, for me, you know, a couple grams. Right? So it's like one of those things where it's, I've known people that have taken copious amounts more. And I will say, like, the acetyl carnitine, that one is a little bit of a hoax. Uh, doesn't seem to really be super effective at crossing the blood brain barrier. And even if it does, it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on anything. So, although some people are big fans of it, you're much better off just going for the cheap version. Of it. Thank you to Vivo Health for sponsoring this episode of the show. Listen, guys, I will never take a sponsor that I don't actually use myself. So I have to use their products. And Vivo Health, I went after because I love Vivo Barefoot. If you see any of my training videos, you will see me wearing either black or white shoes that look flush to the ground. These are Vivo Barefoot shoes. I love these shoes because I feel as if when I am lifting and when I am doing sled pushes and plyometrics that my coach Carlos makes me do, I feel very stable. It is a shoe without a heel. I'm able to balance and really anchor to the ground. And whether I am inside or outside, these shoes, they just absolutely do it for me. I strongly suggest that you try Vivo Barefoot. Again, my favorite shoe in the longest time. And they're offering my listeners a 100-day trial on their footwear, which means they believe in it. You can purchase yours by going to their website, vivobarefoot.com slash Dr. Lion, or use the code Dr. Lion for 15% off your first order. These shoes are made responsibly from recycled material, which I think is really important because we're not just contributing to landfills. You guys will absolutely be obsessed with this footwear. Head on over to vivobarefoot.com slash Dr. Lion and grab yours today. Thomas DeLauer, I'm so happy to be able to sit with you and have you on the show. You are an extraordinary human and you have a very interesting history because you have one of the largest and what I would also say most effective fitness channels on YouTube and you are somewhat self-taught. I would love to hear a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah, no, I have zero credibility whatsoever. <laughs> I, I mean, I've always... Well, first off, I mean, I've always been an in of one type of person, right? And a lot of my early content was really just my own self-experimentation. Like, and I've always been pretty open about that. Like, I just try different things and see what works for me and then kind of validate it with what I can see in some research and kind of just try to gain my own understanding. But what happened is when I was in the biotech kind of biomedical sales world, uh, I learned how to articulate subject matter quite well and I learned how to read a paper. And reading scientific literature is not as easy as like people think and i'm not a biostatistician I, I don't know how to read the statistics portion and like that, that part can be difficult but how to read a paper is like something that I, I really wish more people would really learn and i learned how to articulate it because when you're in sort of a sales role like you have to be able to articulate like and we were in the laboratory services world so like early salivary cortisol testing stuff like that and had to be able to kind of explain that stuff predominantly to fee-for-service physicians during that time with that, like it was sort of a trial by fire. Like I, and I, I learned that what I was good at was dumbing things down. I always joke because I know you're a doctor. Dumbing things down for doctors. You know, the, Thank you. <laughs> we, we struggle, so I appreciate that. No, I, I do appreciate that. Where, <laughs> and there's nuance to that. But what I mean is, like, we were in the business of of giving doctors ancillary tools to kind of help their fee for service practices, and doctors are usually uh, openly not very good with business like right? they're like hey my focus is on medicine right so being able to articulate to them like how this is intriguing for a patient or how this cool thing and how we could study this and how this could be advantageous for the patient especially in a fee-for-service model where it really is about patient outcome because like they're not going to be coming back as a patient paying concierge fees if they're not getting the results that they want so it's a little more results oriented medicine uh, so i kind of learned well hey i'm good at articulating this stuff 
Um, when I was in that world, or just prior to that world, I was a, I was a physician recruiter. So I, I've been in the healthcare world, both on the administrative side and the physician recruiting side, and then the biomed side for quite some time. Um, I, I dropped out of college because uh, I got you know, accepted into Cal Poly. I went to Cal Poly and I said, you know what, this is not for me. Like I felt like it was just not, I wanted to get into business, honestly. And I, so I did. And so From I, an entrepreneurial perspective? Yeah. So I ended up you know, kind of taking what I had to do, which was a commission only healthcare wow. job. And then I realized, like I saw really a kind of a flash of what I really wanted to do. Like I really liked that. And I contemplated like, do I go back to school and maybe actually just like become a doctor or something? Because this is fascinating. So I took like a serious liking to it. And then the, just the medicine or the science, the science, part? absolutely the science, mm -hmm. because like at the time I was working predominantly in like long term acute care. So the LTAC world and, you know, there was like the administrative side that I really liked, but I really some of the people that I was recruiting, um, you know, recruiting a lot of like directors of nursing and things like that. I just kind of took an interest there. And then once I kind of built a physician list and kind of built this client list, uh, I got recruited, you know, so I worked in a uh, basically in the private equity world with this firm and it was then when I realized like okay like this is what I'm good at I am not a scientist I'm never gonna be a scientist I don't know you're pretty good at I, I don't want you to sell yourself short because I love your content and you do a great job at translating the science so that people can understand it well I think that's what made me unique is I and I lean into that like I'm a good communicator and I used to fight it. I used to be like, no, I've got to be an expert. I've got to be an expert. And then I realized like, no, what I'm an expert in is being that translator, being an effective communicator, because that's what the scientific community doesn't really have. It's what they need. And like, I, I pay attention to the nuance. I have my own biases and my own opinions and things that have worked for me. And I've, you know, grown to maybe not put those things at the forefront of my content anymore because my opinion is one thing, but I also like to, you know, hmm. have some discipline with how I go about my content. But I just realized that I was really good at articulating complex subject matter, more so in a way that was effective, but even more so a way that got people excited. So as time went on, researchers would come to me because they'd be like, hey, like, you can get people excited about our research. Like, can you talk about this? I love that. And it kind of, uh, so I just leaned into it. So I, I don't try to be something I'm not. I'm just, I understand the biochemistry. I'm pretty confident in that. Um, and I've got a repository of useless shit in my brain. <laughs> I do have a photographic memory. Tell the truth. It's got to um, be pretty close. Pretty good. I, I'm definitely a visual learner. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and your content, again, is amazing. You talk a lot about fat loss. And I do want to know, and we're going to talk about all kinds of things. We're going to talk about taurine and blood flow restriction and things that you're excited about because then the audience can be excited about it and you're very good at the literature. But what they also care about is fat loss. And I am so curious because you've been in this space and have, you have a lot of longevity in this space. And what are some of the trends that you see that have been the most effective over time? As far as fat loss is concerned, you know, I've seen all kinds of different trends come and go. Shaken, what is it, the shake and bake? Remember that? Oh yeah, totally, the shake weight. I mean, 100%, <laughs> that is the most effective way to lose fat. All right, podcast is over. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like go out, like Amazon's gonna sell out after this podcast. I would say, you know, from a, a nutritional standpoint, I think when people started, uh, man, that's a tough one to answer because like I have lived in a little bit of an echo chamber for quite some time, right? So a lot of my content was kind of stemmed around lower carb ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, all with giving thoughtful nods to caloric restriction being a fundamental piece of that. But I mean, in the echo chamber that I was living in, there was huge success happening there, right? Like that was, I was seeing it in almost myopically, like why are people not talking about this more? It worked for me, it worked so well for people, it works so well for all these people that are watching my content. So I don't wanna discount that because that is a lot of what I saw. Like intermittent fasting for a lot of people, exceptionally effective. And when, so again, you've had your channel for nine years. When you first started the channel, what were some of the things that you were talking about from a fat loss? You know, when I first started talking about things, I actually was talking more about just like chronic inflammation and things like that because it was just near and dear to me. My wife suffered with inflammatory issues. My wife was, uh, had autoimmune conditions. So a lot of these things were like I was learning about. Um, and I was very interested in that myself. And then a lot of things I was talking about was my own personal 100 pound weight loss. So I talked a lot about like what worked for me as far as a ketogenic diet, as far as intermittent fasting. So that was kind of the early stages, but a lot of it was very basic kind of fundamental fitness and fat loss in the beginning. And then 
as I started to do more content, I realized like, okay, well, what I was good at articulating was much more uh, what I had experienced, which was via lower car, lower car protocols and you know intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding. So, in the sphere of fat loss, like what I've seen be really effective now is people focusing a lot more on like we talked about in another video, like moving more and eating more, higher amounts of protein, even higher fiber in conjunction with high protein uh, being extremely effective. You know, a lot of people have had success by limiting carbohydrate consumption, not because carbohydrates are bad, but because such a vast majority of people are metabolically deranged to begin with mm -hmm. that they are in a category that reducing carbohydrates might be effective for them. So that can easily get misconstrued as, oh, Thomas thinks carbohydrates are bad. No, I think that there's a lot of people that have metabolic dysfunction that could probably stand to reduce carbohydrates. And there's good evidence to suggest that. We saw in some of the research that when you just reduce carbohydrates, to, I mean, the average American is eating 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. It's ridiculous. Yeah. 300. If you reduce it to 130, then we see improvements of, in triglycerides in two weeks. So there is evidence to support uh, reduction of carbohydrates. Yeah. And it's like, so, I mean, although I've made enemies by being in that camp, uh, I've also helped a lot of people and seen a lot of success with it. Um, what would you say now uh, in terms of fat loss? What are your top... Um, three to five, as many tips as you'll give for the listener of how to, because by the way, you look great and you have maintained your physical fitness and your health for a long period of time. I never see you go and ebb and flow, right? You're not gaining weight and losing weight. You're very steady now. Yeah, no, I, I really, you know, aim for that. And that's, you know, I would say, you know, maintaining leanness is a very high priority for me, you know, along with maintaining muscle. It's like, those are like, as far as my personal life is concerned outside of my family, like those are the things I focus on and I like it and I enjoy it. Uh, I would say, you know, for me, like one thing that we share sentiments on protein by all means, like that is my fundamental rule for fat loss. How much do you recommend? I'm so for me, I go a little bit more than one gram per pound of body weight. Thank you to Air Doctor for sponsoring this episode of the show. You know, when I had a large brick and mortar practice in New York City, I did everything right, but my environment was sick. This is one reason why I absolutely love Air Doctor because you do need a doctor for the air. A lot of the air that we breathe, depending on where we are, is polluted. It was definitely in New York City. I didn't even realize it was one of the reasons why I was feeling sick. And indoor air quality is huge and it can be even more polluted. It can be two to five times even more polluted than outdoor air, depending on your circulatory systems of air within that building. Air Doctor has done a fantastic job. I have been using them long before they came and as sponsors to the show you can get an Air Doctor yourself. Air Doctor comes with a 30-day breathe easy and money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com and use the code Dr. Lion. You'll receive up to $300 off air purifiers. This is exclusive to my podcast you will also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. So go ahead over to Air Doctor. That's A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R pro.com and use the promo code Dr. Lion. Great. Now that's pretty hefty, like, I mean, for a lot of people, right? Like if you're 300 pounds and you're 100 pounds overweight, then maybe that's not ideal for you. Maybe it's worth, in my opinion, getting a DEXA and seeing, you know, maybe aiming for more of your lean body mass or something like that. But, you know, for me, I find if I strive for a minimum one gram per pound of body weight, I'm feeling good. I feel like I'm in a good spot and I feel like my strength is maintained and I feel like my body composition is where I want it. And most importantly, when I have those protein needs met, I don't feel like I'm indulging in other things. I don't feel like my my, my cravings for carbohydrates aren't there. My cravings for higher fat, you know, hyperpalatable foods just aren't there. The moment that protein is down, those cravings start to creep in. It never goes away. I was still a fat kid before, like I, it's gonna come back, you know? So like I, it's like those cravings are just ingrained. And you lost a hundred pounds. Yeah. You were actually overweight. I was very overweight. Gosh. Um, and what does the evidence suggest? Cause I know that you read, so I'm gonna put you on the spot cause I know you read a ton of literature. 
when you've gone through the literature on dietary protein, where do you see um, it range in terms of optimizing body composition? Uh, generally speaking, like obviously we know the recommended allowance is like ridiculous, right? We're looking at 0.8 yeah. per kilogram. You know, I've seen it range from like 0.6 grams per pound of body weight all the way up to like 1.2, mm -hmm. you know, in various studies. Uh, I do personally think that people could probably get by with like 0.6 to 0.8 per gram or grams per pound. I think that that's, that's perfectly acceptable. But I do think that your intensity of your training, your training volume plays a huge role in how much you need. Not to mention you know, how active you are throughout the course of the day. I'd even argue that like your stress levels and other things like that can determine or can dictate how much you should be trying to get in. So again, if you look at the literature, most people that are lean, if you kind of reverse engineer their diets, they're eating high amounts of protein. And then if you look at even most studies that are actually you know, controlled and putting in somewhat of a metabolic ward where you're controlling for these things, like without fail, it almost always seems that the higher protein ends up with less lean body mass loss and more body fat loss. And the same is true for fiber, but not to the same degree as protein. So I've come to believe that like, okay, we have one camp that really like leans into fiber and unfortunately, that camp that leans into fiber a lot of times likes to point the finger negatively at protein. Right. And then unfortunately, the protein category also negatively points at the fiber. And I'm like, hey, guys, they both work on potentially different axes Let's here. Let's just be friends. Like, they're both yeah. like uh -huh. acting like GLP-1 receptor agonists in some ways, too. So like we're getting like kind of a, like a serendipitous sort of semaglutide-like effect by eating fiber, but also by eating protein. So maybe both of those is great. So I eat a pretty high-fiber, high-protein diet. Uh, how do you define high-fiber? Not ridiculously high. I eat probably 35 to 40 grams. Okay. Just and, higher than what most people eat. <laughs> right. And what is the, the current recommendation is around 25 grams yeah. a, a day. So. But most people aren't getting anywhere near that. Right. Yeah. So number one, protein for fat loss. Number two, fiber for fat loss. Do you care where the fiber comes from? What kind of fiber? I tend to lean to soluble fiber. So I, although I do eat a fair bit of vegetables, like I really like to get my fiber from soluble forms. So, so like give me a fair bit of flax, fair bit of chia, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what are the other tips for fat loss? I'd say, I mean, simple ones, like we talked about before, like I aim to get at minimum 10,000 steps per day. Like that's, and yeah, I mean, obviously there's going to be days where that doesn't happen, but I feel like my non-exercise activity thermogenesis is the biggest lever that I can pull because I can try to squeak more out of my workouts, but like I view my workouts as just like a catalyst. I don't view my workouts as how many calories did I burn in this workout? I just, that. I, I know that. that it's splitting hairs. I know that like if I push it 10% harder in my workout, like if my workout is 300 calories, let's just say hypothetically, and I push it 10% harder, which is a lot, that's only de delta right. like 30 more calories. That just seems like an inappropriate use of energy mm. because then that extra 10 or 20% that I put into my workout, not saying don't like, like half ass your workouts, but I'm saying like, that's not how I'm trying to achieve a deficit, right? My deficit is going to be achieved via my non-exercise activity thermogenesis or nutritionally or whatever. My workouts are a catalyst. My workouts are the mm. stimulus and I've viewed it and I've changed my mind to view it that way over the last like seven or eight years where it's like, no, these are dues that need to be paid. It's not about me putting myself in a deficit. It's about me triggering the hormonal and signaling device cascade that's going to happen throughout the rest of the day, activating and you know, stimulating these myokines so that my nutrition can do the work. Mm, I love that. And then how would you, how do you think about your non-exercise activity thermogenesis? For the listener who doesn't know what that is. Yeah. I mean, I put it in different categories for sure. I mean, there's the sort of passive non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which are just the things that you would never even be cognizant of. That's even things like fidgeting, like not that I consciously try to fidget more. But it, when you look at the literature on fidgeting, like was I think it's a 54% increase in metabolic rate if someone is sitting and fidgeting compared to lying down, right? So obviously it says, well, the person's lying down. Okay, well, there's still- You know that everybody listening has now just started to fidget. Right, it's nuts. But Keep going, like, guys, keep going, get it, your reps in. And then going from standing or sitting to standing and fidgeting was like another significant increase. So the point is, is like, those are the things that sometimes are ingrained in us that we don't always realize. Like, you know, there's always the kid in school that was like, kind of bouncing his leg a lot, oh, yeah. right? That's, and I was that that's, kid. Uh, me too. Yeah. And, I'm still that kid. I mean, maybe that's just fundamentally who we are as people. Like, we're wired to be more like that. We're a little bit more sympathetic tone where we're just kind of that way. Um, so those things are passive where, like, you can't 
you can consciously change it, but you're probably not going to consciously change it unless you're like making a very concerted effort. Like mm. it's something that's just like you are a fidgeter. Like, but the point is, is that's one category of non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And then there's the more conscious forms, which is like it's just your daily life, but being proactive on it. Like if I'm sitting on the couch and there's dishes to be done. I think about it as like, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to do those dishes. You may think it's just dishes. You're only going to burn 50 calories doing that. Those little things stack up. Not to mention, I make my wife happy. Totally. <laughs> Not to mention, like, I'm doing something. I'm being productive, but I'm also getting a cardiometabolic effect. And mm -hmm. I'm putting myself in a potential deficit. I'm moving. I'm using my muscle. As you mentioned in one of our videos, like, Simply just using your muscles a lot of times is a stimulus to at least prevent catabolism, mm -hmm. you know, to a certain degree. So if, you know, putting some dishes away is at least utilizing my muscles enough to where I'm not just sitting on the couch wasting away completely. So those are the things that are more conscious. And then I might be like, oh, you know what? So it encourages me to do chores around the house. It encourages me to park further away from the uh, you know, entrance to a grocery store, you name it. So we have the non-activity thermogenesis, non-activity... Um Thermogenesis includes fidgeting, not consciously, movement of doing small tasks, and then walking or, or parking away. What else, and, and then I really love what you said about the exercise component, that's a catalyst. What else do you think is effective for fat loss? Yeah, I mean, if we kind of went into maybe a supplement category. Yeah, this let's is do a, it, because I mean, you love reviewing supplements. I cannot believe you were so knowledgeable on chlorogenic acid, and we don't have to talk about that, but... I yeah, mean, it seems a very big interest. I mean, I'm like just a, a dork. I like this stuff. And like, you know, it doesn't mean I take all of them, but I like, I enjoy talking about them. Like I would much rather, and let it be known, like I would much rather just get my supplement through my food. Like, like I don't take a lot of supplements. I take magnesium. I take caffeine. I, you know, rotate some other ones, fish oil, uh, you know, quercetin. I kind of cycle certain ones in and out of my life. But as far as fat loss is concerned, Caffeine, probably one of the most effective things that you can take. Uh, the timing of it matters. I mean, I would... Tell me about the timing and the dosing. Well, I think with dosing, I want to say, I just read this, it's... Uh, is, it point th is it three milligrams per kilogram is like the, the upper range? I think that's what it is. I think it's th like three milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, you know, caffeine is like kind of where the line of diminishing return kind of yes. starts. Yes, and we've all felt that line of diminishing return where... It's like, yeah, where like mentally, but also even from a, like a fat loss perspective. And arguably, caffeine, it was interesting because I read a paper and did a video on this as well. Caffeine mobilizes fat, right? So in theory, you're like, okay, great, it's increasing fat loss. But if you're not actually triggering oxidation, then that mobilization does you no good. So you can't just like sit on the couch and like, drink coffee and hope that you're going to get fat loss. You need to execute upon it, right? It's just like being in a, in a sauna. Like it's kind of interesting. A sauna can actually mobilize lipids. But then if you like go exercise after sauna utilization, then maybe you've already done part of the work. Maybe they're mobilized and you could oxidize them easier. But the same conversation is a little bit more clear with caffeine. It's like if you're mobilizing fatty acids and then you go and oxidize them, that's when caffeine has a true fat burning effect. And the activation of cyclic adenosine monophosphate as sort of a secondary messenger, right? So like cyclic adenosine monophosphate, very fundamental part of, you know, you know, just energy manufacturing. But like if you are exercising and you've activated AMPK and you're utilizing, creating more ATP as a secondary messenger, independent of ATP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate becomes sort of a signaling messenger to signal all these other things that happen that say, hey, we're in a deficit, we're using energy, we need to go downstream and signal all this to happen. And caffeine kind of activates that more. So in essence, it makes your exercise have a stronger effect as far as signaling processes are concerned, which can have a huge effect in a lot of different categories, but particularly for fat loss. Hmm. Anything else that you're super excited about? Um, I for am, fat loss. Yeah. Okay, specifically for fat loss, uh, carnitine, I think, is a really underrated thing. You do. Tell me. Okay. Okay, so here's the deal with carnitine. Yeah, so I have to explain what it is. Okay, so carnitine is a very important amino acid that is used for uh, building these transport vehicles, right? So carnitine palmitoyl transferase yes. one specifically, which shuttles fat into a mitochondria. And by the way, leucine activates that. Interesting. I did not yeah. know that. So obviously, they're dependent with each other, right? So... Carnitine is fascinating to me. 
The reason it's fascinating is because as someone that spent a lot of years just studying fatty acid metabolism and understanding that piece as someone that was heavily into a ketogenic diet and just really into that world, I always found it kind of fascinating. And a lot of the people online kind of tout the research that says like, okay, well, carnitine, like our body creates it, like you don't need it, it's not a big deal, you're getting enough from the diet. However, the literature suggests that like, you can deplete 75 to 80% of your carnitine stores in one workout. That's hard. Like, so 75% VO2 max, I think it's sustained for like 45 to 60 minutes, can deplete your carnitine stores by up to 80%. So if you're not eating a lot of red meat and you're not eating good high value proteins, you're going to be deficient in that. And if you are training aggressively, you're gonna be even more deficient in that. So especially true. So carnitine, if you're eating like a perfect diet, it may not be important to supplement with it. But there's a reason why it becomes such an important tool when it comes down to not necessarily fat loss, but indirectly fat loss. At least fatty acid metabolism and transport. So like without CPT1, like fats aren't getting into the mitochondria. And that is, problematic for A, fat loss, body composition, but it's also problematic for just the downstream, like even the gene expression that occurs as a result of that. Like the more fats that are coming into the mitochondria, the more uh, sort of marinating in fats your cells end up developing yes. and you have more gene transcription that's occurring, gene expression specifically like PGC1A, so more mitochondrial biogenesis. It's like this entire downstream pathway that paves the way for longevity, paves the way for strength, paves the way for um, endurance, not to mention fun side effect, fat loss. I love that. And where, so carnitine is found where in nutrition, in the diet? Red meat? Yep. Red meat. Specifically red meat. Oh, I thought that was bad for longevity. So confusing. Um, and then what are the dosing? What is the dose of uh, carnitine? Yeah, I mean, carnitine, I don't know what an effective dose would be. You know, like I'd say, like, I think it varies from person to person depending on how depleted you are. So, you know, for me, you know, a couple grams. Right. So it's like one of those things where it's, I've known people that have taken copious amounts more. And I will say like the acetylcarnitine, that one is a little bit of a hoax. Uh, doesn't seem to really be super effective at crossing the blood brain barrier. And even if it does, it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on anything. So although some people are big fans of it, you're much better off just going for the cheap version of it. Okay. Um, what else? Any other supplements that you love for fat loss or anything else? Yeah. I mean, for fat loss, that's I mean, green tea extract, I think, is uh, kind of in the same category as caffeine, except there's different effects. So the catechins themselves can have different effects. The catechins like epicatechin or um, like epicatechin 3-galate, which is just EGCG, yep. these catechins have different effects in the body. There's different sort of uh, frequencies, not the word, but basically there's different peaks and valleys with catechins. Catechins are kind of a complicated mechanism mm -hmm. or molecule. So how they work on fat loss is like a little bit different than say how caffeine does. So like with EGCG or green tea extract, you're getting sort of a double whammy of caffeine and these catechins that have proven effects from both a thermogenic side, but also like indirect mechanisms. So I think that's a really big one too, but I usually just get that by drinking green tea. I don't specifically take a green tea extract. Do you think that there's different um, dosages of catechins and epicatechins in the green tea? Is there a specific one that you like? Yeah. Um, there are. There definitely are, like, specifically, like, catechins in, uh, like, jasmine tea are supposed to be, you know, very high. And then you've got uh, different catechins in, like, oolong tea that are completely different. So that is a world that's, first of all, beyond my pay grade, but second of all, <laughs> beyond a lot of people's pay grade. Like, starting to understand, like, if you were to just, like, Google, like, catechins, peaks, and valleys, there are how they react and how like a catechin is formed. Basically, they classify it by these like peaks and valleys. And it's, it's exceptionally complicated, but it just leads me to believe that there's a lot that needs to be discovered there and how it impacts adrenaline and noradrenaline and all these things. Uh, plus the impact with like green tea or green tea extract, or at least with green tea specifically, is you have theanine in it as well, yeah. which is kind of cool because that can help you with your tolerance to caffeine so you're going to get sort of a more sustained, or not sustained, but a repeat effect from caffeine without sort of that diminishing effect that comes from tolerance. So what is theanine and is it in all teas? Thank you to Timeline Nutrition for sponsoring this episode of the show. You guys have heard me talk about MitoPure, a supplement that I wish that I had invented. It is made of urolithin A in part. And what is MitoPure? 
MitoPure helps our mitochondria produce energy, which as we age, sometimes our mitochondria becomes less efficient, less robust. We really struggle with energy, just how we feel, which is one reason why I really strongly believe in MitoPure. Because if you care about living a muscle-centric lifestyle, being forever strong, then you must care about your mitochondria. One of the most effective ways to do that, aside from exercise and keeping your body composition and body fat in a reasonable range, is supplementation. And the way to do that, in my opinion, is MitoPure. Timeline is offering my community 10% off their first order of MitoPure. You can go to timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion and use the code Dr. Lion. You'll get 10% off your order. That's timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. I recommend trying the starter pack with all three formats. That's a good question if it's in all teas. I don't know if it's in all mm. teas. It's a good question. I know it's in green teas. Okay. So really good question. As far as theanine, I look at it mainly as, so it can occupy a similar receptor as caffeine. So in sense, like it can sort of delay some of the absorption or delay some of the adenosine binding. And with that, it can make it so that there's a supplement that's out there, uh, doctor, or just not doctor. Is he doctor? Yeah, Sean Wells, he's a doctor. He's uh, like worked for Compound Solutions for years and he created theocrine, which is essentially like caffeine and theanine in a, in a combined form. Because they really do sort of, in a way, oppose each other, but they're also very synergistic. Caffeine or theanine is an extremely powerful vasodilator too. So like theanine is really good for sleep, in a different category because you have this massive vasodilation and it allows for the cooling of your core because you're getting more blood out to the extremities and that allows your, your core to cool, which is really good for sleep because as your temperature goes down, melatonin levels increase because that's one of the axes in which that pays attention to. Mm. So with caffeine, when you have a vasoconstrictor, which is caffeine, and you take a vasodilator that works upon a different axis, you retain the benefits of caffeine with less vasoconstriction. So think about caffeine mobilizing fats, but the downside is you have a little bit of restriction of blood flow. So the fats maybe aren't mobilizing, you're not getting that uh, sort of that cell volumization that you would get. But with theanine, you kind of open that up a little bit more. So you get a little more blood flow, a little bit more circulation of the caffeine and potentially more circulation of the lipids. Hmm. So moving on from fat loss, unless you have other strategies like uh, cold plunge, have you been into cold plunge I did, at all? I did a video yesterday talking about how cold plunging is not for fat loss. <laughs> I, I, I talked about how, like, Amazing. I like cold plunging. I think it feels great. Do you feel like there's evidence to support it? If you want to get, like, super granular, I'm sure you could find something. But the brown adipose tissue stuff just doesn't get me excited because I know that the strong literature on cold exposure is with more sustained, moderately cold temperatures between like 55 and 60 degrees for brown adipose tissue activation, especially for the beijing of white fat to brown fat. Um, so say that again, because I'm going to change my uh, plunge temperature. Yeah. So, so well, it doesn't yeah. have to be that cold. So it's the great plunge, I think for you, so, okay, I'll back up. In a metabolically healthy person that has a good amount of brown fat already, if they go in a cold plunge, and then they get out and they let their body warm up to ambient temperature naturally. Like they don't immediately, like you're lean and I'm lean. So when I get out of a cold plunge, it's cold. It sucks. For like an hour. It sucks. Yeah. Uh, it, how long are you cold for? I'm freezing for like an hour. It, yeah. It can be an hour sometimes too, right? Yeah. So a lot of times I'll like let myself warm up in the sun for like 20 minutes and then I'll just go take a hot shower. Cause like it, I'm already lean. Like what am I trying to accomplish? Right? Like, so, and I also don't want to stress my body out so much. That's where like that hormetic curve is yeah. really important with the okay. cold plunge. So what I found is that like, I'll just go in for like three to five minutes, usually on the shorter side. Like nowadays I realize that I can just go in for two minutes or so. And I do it mainly for my sleep. I do it mainly for my brain. I do it to not be a big baby and just like do something tough, Pizza. but I certainly don't do it for fat loss. Uh, but I do think that if you get out and you allow your body to warm up, that's when you are getting more of the brown fat activation. And, and you think that the literature supports that for um, leveraging a cold plunge or something like that when the temperatures are not as freezing, but there are benefits. Well, okay, so where the, the literature is strong is less on the cold plunge and it's more about longer term exposure 
to like 55 to 60 degrees. Talking about like being in a 55 or 60 degree ambient temperature for a few hours. Hours? Yeah. So it's like turning your thermostat down to 60 degrees or something like that. Right? Yeah. Hard so pass. You mean like spending yeah, you're not gonna... hours in the cold plunge? Well, you wouldn't, I wouldn't do it in the cold plunge. See, that's just the thing. It's like, like I see cool water immersion. Like there's not a lot of literature that suggests that that's doing anything for fat loss because like no one's putting people in cold plungers for two hours. It's, if you're already metabolically healthy, you probably have a fair amount of brown adipose tissue as a percentage of your total body fat anyway, which means that like any amount of cold exposure when you get out of that is going to activate that. And let it be known that there's two very distinct differences between brown fat like creation and brown fat activation, right? Like things that stimulate brown fat or the beijing of white fat to brown fat are entirely different hmm. than activating your brown fat. Activating your brown fat assumes you already have a lot of brown fat, which means you're already a healthy person, which means that, yeah, maybe some cold plunge can stimulate that brown fat more, but then it begs the question, do you need it, right? So what's more important is the beijing of white fat to brown fat, which comes the from like... The beijing of white fat to brown fat. And how would somebody do that? Exercise. <laughs> Exercise. Is there a dose-dependent nature? Yeah, so as far as a dose-dependent, I'm sure there is. Uh, not that I'm aware of like right at this moment, but I'm sure there is like a, you know, a certain amount that's going to be you know, effective for that. Uh, you know, typically in the case of brown fat or beijing from white fat to brown fat, it is a little bit more cardio oriented, seems to be. Um, resistance training, I'm sure, plays a role too. The literature is just kind of weak there. There's just not a lot. But as far as like, cardio is concerned, cardio does seem to impact that. You know, you said that you use the cold plunge for um, sleep. And how does it impact sleep? And does it, I mean, it seems like it plays a role in somewhat of the neurotransmitters. Are there. Yeah, you know, what I've noticed is, you know, for me, I think having a big like adrenaline dump like that a few hours, because I'll typically cold plunge at night. I used to cold plunge in the morning because I used to be about, oh, I want to start the day with something. Makes hard. you exhausted, doesn't it? It does make me exhausted. And I get like a little surge of energy for a couple hours or maybe an hour. And then I kind of tank. And what I was realizing. And then you have your caffeine. Yeah, exactly. So you're getting like this multiple cortisol. It just didn't seem like it made sense. Mm. Because when I get up in the morning, I'm one of these guys that's already like wake up like a bear is trying to attack me anyway. Like I, when I, time to go, it's time to go. Like I don't wake up groggy. Like I wake up like, let's go. And like I'm already probably having a significant cortisol spike. As a matter of fact, like when I've tested my cortisol in the morning, it, it is typically high. And like, and by I, high, he means 500. No, I'm yeah, right. I don't, I don't need to be like adding more stress. So like what I typically do is get up wait for a little while, and then I'll go work out like an hour after I wake up. I used to roll out of bed and go work out. And then I kind of realized that, like, first of all, like, as my kids, you know, like, I don't yeah. want to miss my, you know, the no. mornings with my kids are super important. So, like, having a little bit of time. And that's when they're cutest. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to miss that because eventually they're going to be getting up at noon, you know, and, like, they're going to be getting up by the time I go to bed. So I've noticed that, yeah, I just feel better. I get a better sleep effect if I cold plunge at night. And I typically only do it like two, maybe three times per week, maybe for like two minutes nowadays. And, you know, I'm a much bigger fan of the sauna by a long shot. Tell me, and what kind of sauna? And does it have to be, could it be infrared? Does it have to be uh, dry heat? Because there's yeah. all different kinds. I think dry heat's the way to go. <laughs> I mean, it's like infrared definitely has its perks. But remember, like infrared... It's not getting as hot, so you're not nearly getting the same heat shock protein effect. You're getting much more of What's a the heat shock protein. Heat shock proteins are chaperoning proteins that are essentially making it so that uh, the mis or there's less misfolding of proteins, right? So proteins are always going through a folding and unfolding process, um, and when they are misfolded, basically, you have protein aggregation that can occur and all kinds of like downstream like DNA effects. So it's basically. What's happening with the chaperoning protein is just as the name implies, it's chaperoning these proteins to materialize properly. So proper cell formation occurs, but heat shock proteins are also sort of a protective mechanism, just like the name implies. They are a heat shock protein that protects us from heat. So it triggers all these different processes that make us more efficient in the heat. And in that same sense, like you're thinking like, why do I want to be more efficient in the heat? Well, the same things that make you more efficient in heat are the same things that make you more efficient in exercise. Exercise induces heat shock proteins. Same like, like with, you know, hypoxia inducible factor one, HIF one, like these same kinds of things that exercise and hypoxia induce are these stress responses that make us more resilient, but make us categorize proteins and, you know, proper gene expression to be stronger humans. Uh, sauna is an exercise mimetic, and that's like 
the most passive form of exercise that you could get, right? You're getting all these effects of exercise, not the biomechanical stuff, but you're getting, you know, the systemic effects. So it's hugely beneficial for me, plus I just, the glymphatic system, like what it does to the brain and impacting sleep, by increasing that intracranial pressure by just kind of creating more heat in the brain and pressure in the brain. And it's why like after a head injury, you don't want to go in a sauna, right? right? You want to like wait until some time has passed because in creating more intracranial pressure when you already have inflammation in the brain is not necessary, or immediate inflammation. How hot does the sauna have to be? You want to know how hot I make mine or how hot I can <laughs> What does the literature say? And then we want to know how hot you make yours. Legally, I'm not allowed to say like more than 190. Okay. But I'll tell you what I do. But what is the, does the literature go past 190? There is some Finnish research that yeah, shows about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, in the Thomas DeLauer, you know, Journal of Thomas DeLauer, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I rigged mine to get to about 230. Okay. And I usually do 15 to 20 minute bouts at 230 degrees. How long did it take you to lead up to that? One time. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay. No, uh, it, honestly, just a couple times. Yeah. Like, I mean, just because I set a timer, and I think I did the first couple times, I, I did it for like 10 minutes. Mm. You know, it's really not that bad. I meditate in there, I get my head in the right place, you know. So, um, and then how often should someone be in a hot sauna? I think three times a week is a tremendous thing. And if you don't have access to a hot sauna. What if they can only do it at 190 degrees? It's fine. Just go a little bit longer. I'd say 20 minutes is a good dose. Three times a week. And then do you shower right after with charcoal soap or is there kind of some kind of something that you do? I use charcoal soap anyway, so it doesn't have anything to do with just the sauna. I just, um, but I mean, I don't always shower right away. A lot of times, like if I'm saunaing in the morning, I'll sauna before I go for a run because I feel like it kind of loosens me up. I feel like I gain a little, it's, it may not, it's indirectly backed up by literature, but not directly like, hey, sit in a sauna and then go exercise. If you add up the mechanistic nature of what's happening in a sauna, it actually kind of makes some sense to sit in a sauna and then go for a little run. Like it almost like wakes me up. However, from a growth hormone standpoint and a recovery standpoint, it makes more sense to get in a sauna after your exercise. What about for, uh, from a hypertrophy standpoint? Does it augment hypertrophy or does it diminish any kind of There's gains? some literature that suggests that, yeah, in a positive way, it augments hypertrophy. Mm. So it's the same thing like heat shock proteins can have a positive impact on muscle protein synthesis as well. And there's some evidence that suggests that it helps with the fusion of satellite cells. So the, the cells that are essentially, well, you're familiar in this one. No, world. the listener but, wants to I mean, know. a basic term, basic yeah. way to put it, I'm not a super expert in this but I always kind of like describe a satellite cell in a very uh, simple way I'm saying like think of a satellite cell as a satellite that's like floating mm -hmm. over the muscle okay and then like the satellite or a UFO that's like floating over the muscle and then all of a sudden it like beams down it's it's beamed to the muscle okay and then like it can kind of grow from there and this is that's kind of how in a very simple way like muscle growth is kind of happening you have these mm -hmm. satellite cells and then you like fuse to the satellite cells Again, I'm not an expert there, but I know enough to kind of be dangerous. So that's what can happen is it maybe has to do with the heat and the pliability, like maybe satellite cells mm -hmm. can fuse better. Maybe it has more to do with like, you know, stem cell proliferation there. Uh, but there's some, some newer evidence. It's not super strong yet. Um, and then we, I know that we want to talk about taurine because I think you're pretty excited about taurine lately. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So tell us what taurine is. Why should we use it? Just lay it out. Yeah. It's a sulfur amino acid. So it's something that we get from, you guessed it, meat. Uh, the rarer, the better. When you cook meat, it does break down the taurine. I did not know that. Yeah, so with, uh, and uh, you know, say what you want about Paul Saladino. He did point me to that research, which I thought was interesting, that as you heat, as you heat red mm -hmm. meat, it does degrade the, the taurine by about 50%. So the rarer, the better. So it's like with red meat specifically. I never eat rare red meat. Oh, you don't? Never. Oh, uh, see, so yeah, I, I I'm way too concerned about gastrointestinal health. Yeah, well, knowing what I know from you now, <laughs> I'm... You're never yeah, eating a I, rare, so just be, you have to double your consumption of meat, that's all, to get your... your that's okay, a good, so that's sorry, a good day for me. Yes, it's okay. just expensive. Yeah. But the, uh, so yeah, so taurine is fascinating to me because it has a, like a dual effect, and like I'm just a performance nerd, right? Like I've realized in what I do that I don't necessarily... I shouldn't be necessarily talking about public health and things like that because I'm not a clinician. I don't have that background. But what I can talk about is performance. And what I really like to lean into is performance because I'm obsessed with it. And taurine as a performance enhancer, I would probably go on record and say it's like probably the most underrated performance mm. enhancer that's out there. And like Red Bull had it right originally, minus the sugar, with you know the caffeine and the taurine. Like they had a high amount of taurine in that crap. And how much taurine, do you know how much taurine one could get from 
a steak versus a supplement? How much yeah, taurine? I think are we you can get about, about a gram from a good steak, okay. right? So it's, and I might be wrong on that, but I think that's about average. You know, like a good like uh, eight to twelve ounce mm -hmm. steak, you can like look in the one gram ballpark. And I believe there's certain cuts that have more. Now with taurine, you know, supplementation, the literature suggests that anywhere from one to six grams has a very very similar effect. So it doesn't seem like more is necessarily better. Okay, now what's really interesting is in the strongest literature, I think this particular study looked at like 14 different studies meta-analysis, it was like whether they gave it over a two-week period of time or they gave it in a like a single bout, single bolus, it had the same impact on performance, which we'll talk about what that impact was in a second, which goes to show that that's what's extra cool about it is you don't need to load it, you don't need to be taking it for long periods of time, you can take it sort of ad hoc, right? Like you can be like, I, I took it before our workout today because That's why you did better. I wanted to make sure that you knew who was boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I'm a five foot one female who weighs like 110 pounds. And was pounds. keeping up. And by the way, with CrossFit workouts that we were doing, supposed to scale the RX for females. You notice I didn't do that for you, right? No, why would you? So it's you? like when I'm supposed to do, like typically you'll see like 20 calories on the bike for men, oh, do 15 not scale or 12, it for me. and I didn't scale it That's for you. Right. So like there's a win No, there, no, right? no, you shouldn't be scaling yeah, it for me. She's keeping up with the boys for sure. Yes. Anyhow, uh, so what they saw in the, these various studies was that in all studies, there were improvements in VO2 max, improvement in time trial times, three and four kilometers, improvements in uh, time to exhaustion, anaerobic performance, endurance, like insane, like just across the board. Was it statistically significant? Yes. Mm. And then when you're looking at, and then there's other literature that was suggesting that there's, a, you know, breaking it down into like these different categories, same kind of thing. This was like 20 different studies. And again, you're looking at the same kind of thing, like ranging from 10 minutes prior to exercise to two minutes before, or, or 10 minutes prior to exercise to two hours before exercise. So what's interesting with taurine is that it acts in sort of a dual sense. It's a an antioxidant, okay, and there's... Is it because it's a precursor for, or is it just because it's a sulfur amino acid? I think it's just because it's a sulfur mm -hmm. amino acid, but there might be some precursor effects too. Mm. And what leads me to believe that is, there are some studies where they did muscle biopsies, and they looked at the muscle biopsy and they say, okay, like in a muscle that has been trained heavily and is mm -hmm. exhausted, like they just worked out, there's extremely elevated levels of taurine. Oh, interesting. Which indicates that there's probably some kind of antioxidant effect there, or there's going to be some like precursor effect, like it's doing something mm. that we don't know, right? Like maybe there's other compounds we haven't even figured out yet that taurine is a precursor to. But it's definitely seeming to be potent as an antioxidant uh, and for scavenging free radicals, which is super interesting because how robustly it went up in such a short amount of time with activity and your taurine availability would obviously dictate some of that too. Mm. So if you have more available, more available, it might even go up more, which is interesting because having that impact is hugely important. But so the, it didn't matter if it was two hours before or 10 minutes before. So with the muscle biopsy studies, that was taken at one time. Okay, got it. But independent outside of that got it. in other studies, yeah, it didn't matter whether it was That's two hours before. It does seem to peak one hour after ingestion and then comes down over the course of about six or seven hours after that. Okay. So you typically, the rule of thumb is like if you want the highest plasma levels, then you want to take it an hour before. Okay, got it. Um, and then anything else with taurine that you think is really, really relevant um, I mean, for performance and, and even aging? Yeah, I mean, I would imagine even with aging, like there's got to be, I could speculate there's an anti-catabolic effect with it as well, mm. just because it's, again, it's so essential to the kind of the overall just metabolic health of a, of a muscle and the mitochondria. You know, it's like, if it protects the mitochondria, like similar to how kind of our mitochondria produces uh, like alpha lipoic acid, for example, another common supplement, which I think is very interesting, but I think ALA is very, very interesting, alpha lipoic acid, but our mitochondria produces like just enough alpha lipoic acid to handle the energy associated with that mitochondria. And there's things like that that are just make you go, hmm, like, it's interesting that our body has the ability to upregulate antioxidants just enough for one particular thing. And like taurine is something that seems to like demand increases for taurine when we have more activity or whatever, but we don't always eat more meat according to that, right? We eat meat according to like our protein demands. And this is where it's like, hmm, once again, the quality of protein matters here. 
because like if we're missing out on these mm -hmm. this taurine or these other like you know low molecular weight compounds that we talked mm -hmm. about like very very important creatine as well so it's like as much as i love protein shakes i love them like right. to meet my protein demands that's great but there's more to it than just that i agree what else you love for performance uh beta alanine okay so tell me what is it how does it work I mean, when should we use it? It's been in pre-workouts for a long time. Forever people... since I can remember. Yeah. It's the flushing, right? You take it and you get all flushed. Yeah, you get tingly, like super tingly. And like that's kind of fun because it is fun. Like I like to feel tingly for sure. And I think it's, I don't I know. I usually, if I take it out, I'm usually like, God, that was like the worst choice I ever had. Yeah, you just feel like buzzy, yeah. kind of weird. Yeah, and like yeah. Ears get hot. So I did that before an interview one time. Oh, and yeah. I had to go on camera and my face was all red and my ears were red. It was just... Look like Stan Efferty. Oh, man, it was. I mean, love you, Stan. <laughs> love you, Stan. It was just a really bad decision. I only say that because I love Stan. Of course. And I just stand. We love Stan. We, I joke about yeah, him yeah. being red. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. We talk all about health and wellness. We cannot ignore the importance of blood regulation. And what do I mean by blood regulation? Well, I mean, biomarkers, whether it is your fasting insulin, whether it's knowing what your iron is, knowing what your inflammatory markers are you must track. And I think that people talk a lot about it's not what your blood levels look like, but it's how you feel. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that. It's actually both. You have to feel great, but your blood markers also have to be within a certain parameter. For example, your inflammatory markers or your blood glucose or your insulin. That is why I love Inside Tracker. I think that they offer an incredible service, a service that is affordable and accessible to people. You can go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. You will get 20% off their entire Inside Tracker store. There's a whole host of things that Inside Tracker has. It has personalized plan. It can look at your biometrics and your fitness data, fitness tracking data, all of it to identify where you need help. And for a limited time, you will get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. Yeah, so beta alanine. The research, there's newer research coming out, but it's all kind of echoing a lot of the same yeah. stuff. But I think we're just reinforcing how. So, what cool, is beta alanine? So, beta alanine is a precursor or a building block along with histamine for uh, what is called carnosine. Okay, carnosine, very important compound in the body. But when you're looking at performance, we've all been in a situation when you are, well, maybe we haven't all been there, but you're exhausting a muscle and you get the. You, all the listeners have better been there. Yeah. You guys have better be there. You get the burn, right? Like, like, okay, if you do a bunch of squats in a high repetition range, you get that burn, right? So what happens there is it's not lactic acid or lactate that's accumulating to cause that burn. Lactate does accumulate, but lactate accumulates as a means to give you sort of a second wind of energy of essentially glucose metabolism because it converts back into pyruvate and through there. That's great. It acts as a signaling device. We'll talk a little bit about lactate in a minute, but it's not the lactate that causes the burn. It's an indirect effect of lactate that causes an influx of hydrogen ions to create a very acidic environment in your muscle. And that's what creates the burn. And the only way that we know of that buffers that is usually by increasing carnosine. But you're going to run out of beta alanine, you're going to run out of carnosine, you're going to run out of histamine, these things that make it up. So eventually you're going to, and when I say run out, in that moment. So that burn is going to supersede your ability to kind of neutralize that burn. Beta alanine allows carnosine to build up much faster and allows you to buffer those hydrogen ions and buffer that burn a lot more. By buffer, you mean uh, you're, not limit, you're not limited by kind of that burning nature. Yes. How long, how much time do you think it provides you? It's a good question. I actually don't know specifically, but I can speak from my own experience mm. that I start to notice it degrades after about 90 minutes. I stop getting the effect after about 90 minutes. But you notice an impact. Oh, God, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like huge, monumental. So much so, I mentioned this to you off record, so much so that I abstained from taking it for a long time because I thought that uh, the burn was actually something good that I needed because and if I was pausing the burn, then I was pausing the signaling effects of lactate. Um, 
and again, that'll all make sense, I guess, if we talk more about lactate, which we can in a second. This is that, that effective. Whereas like when I take beta alanine, like my time to exhaustion in like a, I don't know, 12 to 20 repetition range is significantly better. And that's what's interesting. If you look at the beta alanine research, it's like it really helped in like the ballpark of like 60 to 250 seconds. So 60 that to is, 250 seconds. And if you think about that second range, all I think about in the 60 to 250 second range is running the 800 meters in high school and how much I fucking hated it. <laughs> and like how it was the worst possible race yeah. you could ever have someone do because it's just, you hurt the whole time. It's in that range where you're not quite sprinting, but you're not, you know, in beta oxidation. You're just in you're anaerobic. Just, you're in a, a world of hurt. It just sucks. And it's all just that lactate threshold and being a high, how much can you handle? Yeah. Like really. And, uh, and I'm just like, man, I should have used that stuff in high school because that's exactly the range that it's talking about. So for like someone that does like a CrossFit Metcon or like those style of workouts like I do, it is such a secret sauce. Mm. And like you can take quite a bit of it. Like people usually take like 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams, three to five grams. Like I've taken 10 and you get super tingly. What is the recommended, what would you say the literature would support in terms of how much? One some, to three grams. One to three grams. Is it dependent on size? That's a good question. That I don't know, but I can, again, speak from experience that uh, I'm much more sensitive to it now at 180 pounds than I was when I was you know, 220. So I feel like I can get by with a lot less now. Okay. Um, anything else about beta alanine? Um, I mean, just to put it into context. I'm like, going to actually get some Yeah, now, no, I think gonna it's going to make it. a big resurgence yeah. probably as a result of this. Like, I've been shouting it from the rooftops for the last okay. like, couple of weeks just because I'm like, we got to like, yeah, great guy to have on your podcast would be Dr. Tim uh, Ziegenfuss. He's like, get him on. Yeah, he's you a, hear that, Kylie? <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good dude and I can make the connection. Thanks. And uh, yeah, time trial rowing. So they looked at 2,000 meter rowers. Okay, now again, 2,000 meter row is in the same category as like an 800 meter run. Just terrible, terrible, terrible puke fest. Just not fun. And they improved their times with, I can't remember, I think it was two grams. Uh, and they dosed them in the case of beta alanine, they were giving them for a number of days before. But they ended up improving their times 13 to 14%, so 6.4 seconds specifically on this mm -hmm. study, which is huge. Like that is not yeah. a small amount. That's, oh, no, like, no. that's like shaving six or seven seconds off of your 800 meter time. It's like that's, that doesn't just happen like mm -hmm. by chance. And like everyone across the board had big improvements. And this is because it's buffering the hydrogen ions. Let me ask you a question because um, I think there's some myth around this, bicarb. People will say, oh, um, I don't know, my muscles are burning, I should take bicarb. Well, I don't think it translates, like, first of all, like, once it gets to the gastrointestinal. That's right. I, I mean, like, I just wanted to hear you say it. I don't think it works yes. like that. Yeah, it doesn't work uh, it, quite like it that. Doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But some, for some reason, people are still recommending. The, re the reason that yeah. hydrogen, the acidic environment, disrupts your energy is not because of the burn. What happens is when you have such an acidic environment, it freezes glucose uptake. So at a very small, like, microscopic level, so to speak, like, it's not because you can't endure the burn. Like, there's a lot of people out there that could endure the burn, but eventually your muscles will seize because you just can't, you're, you no longer can take up glucose. So it's like, it's, pr it's just standing in the way of that. It becomes so acidic that the cells can no longer take up glucose and, you know, anaerobic glycolysis can no longer occur. So, I mean, with like beta alanine, it all kind of like comes into this, this like lactate discussion, which is quite interesting. Oh, tell me about it. All right. So with, yeah, lactate. I got obsessed with lactate for a little while because uh, like even like Peter Atia like measures his like blood lactate levels. Like what is lactate? Like, so lactate is like the essentially a, well, I think of it more as a signaling device, but what it is is it's a byproduct that forms as a result of uh, anaerobic glycolysis, right? So like you have this compound lactate that forms and we are still investigating and trying to understand everything that it does. Okay. But lactate is something that sends all these signals to um, range from like expressing genes to help recovery, to help uh, increase performance. It's essentially the byproduct of exercise that allows us to get stronger in a lot of ways at a cellular sort of molecular level. Now, what's kind of interesting about lactate is that it's got a number of different properties. It doesn't just acts as a signaling device. It's also sort of our emergency fuel reserve, right? So like if you are taxed all the way, your lactate, people think lactate and lactic acid are the same. That's just a disassociated form 
and it doesn't like really mean much other than the fact that like they're involved with each other, but they're not the same thing. So it's not the lactate that's giving you the burn. Okay, the lactate is sort of a rite of passage. It's a good thing. And the more resilient you are to lactate, the more lactate that you can accumulate before you actually have a problem, the better you can perform because that lactate is like a perpetual motion device. It creates more like energy for your cell to use. You can use lactate as energy. So we want lactate. The idea lactate is a good thing. Lactate, the idea of building up lactate as a negative is, is not true. Correct. Yeah. The, it's the hydrogen ions, the acidic environment that is the bad thing. Lactate just seems to happen at the same time and they're linked and they may be correlated with each other. They probably are. But it could also, for all I know, like they could just rise at the same time, right? But there seems to be pretty strong correlation. What's interesting about lactate is that it increases BDNF, so it communicates with the brain. Okay, there's. So lactate in the skeletal muscle increases BDNF in the brain? That's interesting. So, and a lot of it, again, it has to do with what's called HIF1, so hypoxia inducible factor one, which is a really fascinating compound that's, again, like once this is activated, it's very similar to like a heat shock protein. So HSP70 versus like HIF1, a lot of them like happen together. Like HIF1 is going to trigger all these metabolic changes to make you more adaptable, or how do I say this? I guess more adapted to being in a hypoxic situation. So hypoxia being the lack of oxygen, right? So when you are training anaerobically, you're in a you know, lack of oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. So lactate is not going to accumulate in like a low beta oxidation state. So if I went out for a really low, slow run or a walk, I'm not gonna have a lactic acid burn or hydrogen ion burn or lactate accumulation because I'm not training in a sense without oxygen. So you're only achieving this in a hypoxic state. Okay, now hypoxia, we know from lots of literature, is very good for a lot of things. It's also bad for a lot of things if it goes too far, right? Like you never want your brain to go hypoxic, right? You don't want to go, you don't want to hold your breath and just go hypoxic, right? No, that's but, a terrible idea. But you want to be able to, in a controlled setting, trigger hypoxia so that your body can adapt to become more efficient at utilizing oxygen, but also become more efficient at utilizing lactate and these other alternative substrates. Because just like any adaptation that's going to occur, you're going to get better at anaerobic glycolysis. But what's signaling you to get better? It's not just mechanical overload. You know, the whole like sliding filament theory and stuff like that, it's cute, but I don't think that's all of it, right? Like, I just don't right. think that like building muscle is a result of, oh, I tore my muscle and now it's rebuilding. Like, that's really great to teach teenagers about the benefits of working out. But it's not necessarily all how the world works. <laughs> There's a lot of metabolic things yes. that are happening, as you well know. And lactate is at the forefront of much of that, at least in my eyes, mm. because the downstream effects of lactate are so good for our metabolism, gene expression of so many different things that are related to other transcription factors like um, uh, PPAR alpha or other things that get expressed like PGC1A, which triggers more mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, again, making you better not only at your athletics, but also long term. So it's a rite of passage to be able to accumulate lactate and deal with it. It's like, not only is that a rite of passage from a performance standpoint, but the benefits reign into your daily life and your longevity. So do you think there's any benefit from measuring blood lactate threshold? I think for someone that's performance minded, it can tell you a lot about like really appropriate training ranges. Um, what's the name of that uh, Scandinavian sprinter? Um, what's his name? I can't remember his uh, name. All I watch is Frozen, so I have no idea. Well, it's Scandinavian, so we're part of the way there. Okay. <laughs> Frozen or uh, Ugly Dolls. It's okay, also yeah. on the Well, uh, I don't playlist. really watch it either. I had a, you know, Brad, you know who Brad Kearns? I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was talking about it and it was found it really interesting. Like, he's basically the, you know, up and coming sprinter, like really the setting records all over the place. Like, w during his workouts, they're like stopping and measuring his lactate and being like, okay, time to end today's session. Oh, like, they're really interesting things. So I think there's benefit to testing your lactate if you're either just a nerd or you're trying to like really find your sweet spot mm. with your training. Because to a certain degree, I do think that like if lactate accumulates too much and then you're trying to push through that for a training, for a performance standpoint, there's a line of diminishing return after that, right? So like mm. once lactate has accumulated so much, it's a proxy for your hydrogen ions too. So you'd be like, okay, this has accumulated so much. 
is doing another 400 meter repeat actually just pissing up a rope at this point? Because is it really gonna get me anything more or is it just gonna tax my central nervous system and decrease my HRV to the point where I can't train tomorrow as well? So no, let's get minimum effective dose. Your lactate's accumulated based on your metrics where you need to be, you know, What's your RPE? Okay, let's make a note of that. Come back tomorrow. We'll do the same thing. Minimum effective dose, three repeats, boom. And you can actually get your training programmed that way based on lactate. Is there a way to test it for the normal person on the spot, like a blood glucose monitor? Yeah, I can't remember the name of the meter. Uh, that, there is one. There is one, yeah, because Peter Atia uses it. Mm. And I think Peter Atia kind of stopped measuring lactate. I think he just got on a kick for, for a while because mm. he was doing like a lot of BFR and stuff like that, and he was really interested in it. Um, I tried to talk to him about it a little bit on my channel, but... Didn't really want to go there too much, but <laughs> it's not his super wheelhouse. I think he's just interested in it. Tell me about uh, blood flow restriction, because that's gotten a lot of, and you know, actually, quite frankly, I'm surprised it's not as popular as I think it should be, especially in the aging population and for people who don't want to train super heavy. Yeah, I think it scares people because it, it seems like a very dangerous thing when you look at it on the surface. Or it just looks like a freak bodybuilder thing to do. Okay, so tell us what it is. What it is it probably like? also looks weird, like <laughs> if you're going into a gym. Like I wouldn't go into a public gym doing it. So, so BFR is yeah, blood flow restriction training, which is where you are blocking a certain level of venous return. So you're allowing arterial flow, but then you're blocking venous return. So you're allowing blood to pool. So you put these cuffs that look like blood pressure cuffs on your arms or on your legs, uh, not both at the same time. Do one or the other. And as a result of this, you're, yeah, you're allowing arterial flow, but you're blocking uh, a good percentage of the venous return. And you typically want to do this, full disclaimer, uh, by understanding what your rate of occlusion is. So to do it properly, one would use either a, a, like a Delphi unit or a unit that is actually kind of measuring occlusion properly. Meaning, it would, would you see the occlusion with a blood pressure cuff? Well, you would want to use, like, realistically, like, when I first did it, they used a Doppler ultrasound to actually find, like, what my exact, like, rate of occlusion would be by putting a cuff on me using a Doppler ultrasound. Does it need to be that precise? Or it, it does not need to be that precise because nowadays the devices are much better at it. Like, they can measure, they don't have ultrasounds built in. I think Delphi might have one. Is that well, a company? Yeah, the Delphi unit is, like, the cream of the crop. You know, I use a Smart Tools, which is kind of middle of the line, but it's affordable. It's, like, 300 bucks, mm. you know. And they have a, uh, they just had a new one come out that actually has like the device on the actual cup cool. itself. And then it self regulates while you're training to actually yes, adjust. Yes, please. Yeah. But I mean, first you have to convince us why. Yeah, well, you and just then, look cool. You look yeah. like Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, what you're doing is you're allowing metabolites to pool. Okay. So there's a couple different things. For one, like you're increasing intracellular volume. So you're increasing more fluid in the muscle. And as a result of that, you're actually increasing some internal leverage and you're actually allowing the potential for satellite cells once again to fuse and kind of that stem cell effect there. So that's huge, but that's a little bit weaker science than what we do know as the metabolites pooling. Okay, the metabolites pooling, I'm talking about once again, lactate. So big increases in lactate because you're basically blocking it and you're keeping it there. Okay, so lactate acts as a signaling device but it does act as a signaling device very specific to the muscle trained too. So if you are blocking occlusion around your arm and you're pooling lactate in your arm, then that signaling device is first of all going to be very powerful because it's accumulating and you're going to be able to send a signal to kind of like pro-growth and adaptation and again, HIF-1, hypoxia inducible factor one to that area specifically. Now, You'll also notice when you use BFR that you get to that burn really fast. You're like, what the heck? How much faster? I mean, but it's so fast. Let's just put it yeah. this way. I mean, if I, if I put a BFR cuff on and I picked up a 10-pound dumbbell and did 20 curls with it, I'd be like, ow, this is burning. <laughs> and right? that would be a benefit of using blood flow restriction? Yes. Okay. So a huge, I'll give you like my context in which I use it. If I'm in like an intense running block, like your husband could get big benefit out of this, right? Like intense running block you listening where, to that chain? Like, where I'm getting a lot of mileage in uh -huh. um, and I just don't have the energy to go into heavy resistance training, but I know I need to for maintenance then that is a great time for me to throw BFR cuffs on because I can train with significantly less intensity and with significantly less central nervous system taxation and biomechanical load, but I can get still that same really powerful effect as far as lactate is concerned. And as far as hypertrophy is concerned, there's a lot of signaling that happens with lactate too. That's why we say the hypertrophy range is that like 
eight to 15, eight to 18 repetition range, really that 12 being the sweet spot. Isn't it kind of silly that it also ends up being the same range that you get the most burn in? So there's a lot of evidence suggesting that like lactate could help with hypertrophy too. So when you put BFR cuffs on and you're swimming in that lactate, there's a lot of evidence to suggest it could be really good for hypertrophy, both metabolically and even mechanically. Would someone be able to use that uh, a few times a week, every training session? Are there... I wouldn't do it every training session. You know, one of the things that you have to be cautious with is, you know, like if, yeah, it can put stress on the valves, right, on your on your valve. So like if you're, if you're putting it on too tight, like you don't want to collapse a valve or something like that. So you really have to know what you're doing and you, have someone. Or you should at least have someone show you and help you set your numbers the mm. first time. And the good news is a lot of physical therapists are starting to use it for prehab and rehab. And I think that's where Atiyah learned about it at mm. first. Um, Lane Norton's talked about it for a long time. I don't know if he regularly uses it, but he was shouting the benefits of it years before mm -hmm. it was popular. Um, definitely do not just go on Amazon and get the cuffs that you can like cinch up like with your hand. Like no, it needs to be a very like pretty methodical thing. Uh, like I said, most of the newer devices, like the Be Strong cuffs, the Smart Tools cuffs, the Delphi units, um, they all like you can set it so that when you put the cuff on initially, it calibrates and it kind of almost like it pulses and increases the, the pressure and it kind of slowly decreases the pressure to find that right rate of occlusion. And so it's a lot harder to mess up these days, but you don't need as much pressure as you think you need. Like if you put that sucker on and it's mildly tight and you do, you know, again, you typically want to like lessen the load. You want to go lighter weight, you want to go higher repetition, and you want to have these things on for no longer than 20 minutes with each extremity. So if you put them on your upper body, 20 minutes and after 20 minutes, just kill them, even if you're not done with your workout. Like, turn them off. You just don't want to be like exposing for that long and then switch to your legs. And it's substantially less weight, right? So Much you less. would probably curl, I don't know, what would you curl? 50 pounds or more and you would pick up a 10 or 20 pound yeah, weight. Yeah, I'll play with 10 or 15s and just like and go for high rep. And then, then that's a lot. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. One of the most common questions I get asked is, what brand of creatine do you like? I'm going to answer that for you. I have been using First Form Micronized Creatine for many years, and here's why. I have to say I cycle through whether I'm using creatine or not. When I am going through a really intense training period or thinking period, I know that I'm not going to get enough creatine for my body from food. I will often at this time supplement creatine in first form, makes an incredible product. You can head on over to firstform.com slash a Dr. Lion and grab some for yourself. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. Creatine has been around for a very long time. We hear all about its effect on performance, but I do think that we will start to see more and more emerging evidence for brain function, not just for brain function in the older population, but potentially brain function in the younger population. So sign me up. That is one reason why I love First Forms Creatine. It mixes well. You don't taste it. I think it is a great product. You can get yours at First Form. That's one S T P H O R M dot com slash a doctor lion. And you can grab yours today. That's firstform.com slash doctor lion. In terms of performance, you think that that's a way to go? Once a week, does it matter? How often would you use it? Yeah, I would say so. It's a part of my life at least once or twice a week. Okay, that's a lot, actually. And is there no other workout that day? No, uh, depends. Like sometimes it will be a workout. Like a lot of times I do it on my filming days because I feel like I don't want to like totally tax myself like before filming a long day. But I also know that lactate has a big effect on BDNF. So I also want that little like brain boost that I get. And again, it could be placebo affecting myself, but I feel like I feel really sharp after I do it. Um, so yeah, sometimes it'll be the only thing I do that day. Some days it'll be in tandem with like my longer running days. Okay. And how long are you, how many miles are you putting in, in a week? Right now, it's a lot less. Right now, it's probably only 20, but like even just a few weeks ago, I was up to 50. So that makes me cry. Yeah. And then, you know, years ago, I was close to 100. So it that was like, that makes me not just I don't, cry and makes me cry and I throw up all at the same time. Yeah. I, I go back and forth. Like, I love running. It's fun. I get enjoyment out of it. But I also have to be careful because, like, 
I'm a bigger dude. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's a lot of biomechanical stress. So I like, agree. So I try to like, and I like I learned to run. I ran my first marathon when I was 11, and I learned to run as a heel striker, and it's a very hard habit to break. Mm-hmm. And now being, and, but that was not a huge problem when I was 130 pounds as a runner, right? right? At 180, 185 pounds, like also being stiff from working, from lifting so much and stuff, like heel striking is not a good way to go. So like I'm trying to like retrain myself to land on the midfoot, but like you can't undo 35 years. Of you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. So you can't just undo that. And like, I don't know if I'll be able to retrain myself to run in a different gait altogether without some serious intervention. So I have to check myself. So I try to do more Peloton and things like that just to like, which I know Shane is into now. Yep, we're all, we'll all uh, do it together. That'll and be At each other. Yep. Get competitive. Uh, I'll win. Um, Thomas DeLauer, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think that this was really interesting. We talked about you, which I love hearing your backstory. We talked about fat loss. We talked about taurine. We talked about beta alanine, which everyone is going to try, and blood flow restriction. And I just think that you are the best, and I am so happy I get to share you with my audience. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and thanks for coming on my channel as well. Thanks yeah, for having. Speaking of which, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, I usually say it's more like where can people avoid me because <laughs> I tend to pop up everywhere. Most important thing is I'm not V Shred, even though we're both very similar looking. I'm not V Shred, so you can find me on YouTube, but I'm not the guy that's like eating pizza on ads on YouTube. That's V-Shred. Otherwise, just type in my name, Thomas DeLauer, uh, on YouTube. You'll find all my content there. Instagram, Thomas DeLauer, thomasdelauer.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Mm-hmm.